Good afternoon and welcome to the Art Museum of West Virginia University's Lunchtime Look series. I am going to uh, give everyone a moment to sign in and then we will get started with this afternoon's program. So thank you very much for joining us. And as I'm watching the participant numbers click up, you all can look over my shoulder. The um, painting that is right behind me in our McGee Gallery is actually the painting that today's speaker conserved for the Art Museum of West Virginia University and is going to be part of the subject of her talk. So you can take a moment to take it in in all of its conserved glory while we wait for everyone to sign in. Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Heather Harris and I am the Art Museum of West Virginia University's Educational Programs Manager. And this is our last lunchtime looks for the 2020 and uh, 2021 academic year. So we thank you very much for joining us. And we especially thank all of you who have attended our programming throughout this most unusual academic year. And we hope that we'll be back to seeing some of you in person next academic year, but also that perhaps we can continue some of these virtual endeavors where we can uh, join with our friends and supporters from across the country and across the world. So thank you all for being here. Um, just a few technical notes. First, live captioning is available for this um, program. So if you would like to avail yourself of that option, just click in your Zoom app, the CC button. It's either up top or down below, depending on what, um, what uh, device you are using. And also we are going to have time for Q&A after uh, our speaker's presentation. We ask that you put any questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat. You can put something in the chat if there is a technical problem with the view of the screen or things like that. And I will try my best to assist you as those come through, but mainly we're going to be using the Q&A function. All right. So with those few notes, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Anna Alba. Anna is a painting conservator and the owner of Alba Art Conservation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She specializes in modern and contemporary art. Anna has held recent contracts at the National Gallery of Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So that is a rather exciting uh, company to be in when we say that Anna has conserved this painting uh, by Joseph Dodd, Bluefield, View from My Room for the Art Museum of West Virginia University, which is currently on display in our McGee Gallery. And we encourage any of you who can make it down here in the next two weeks before West Virginia University's uh, commencement to come see it uh, in person if you are able. Uh, but she's going to talk a little bit about that process and about her work. And I look forward to hearing what she has to say. So I'm going to now, without further ado, turn it over to Anna. Well, thank you, Heather, for your introduction. I also want to thank the Art Museum of West Virginia uh, University and their curator, Bob Bridges, for this for bringing me on this project and having me today. Um, and I appreciate all of our attendees for being here and being interested in, in uh, painting conservation. I look forward to showing you my studio. Um, I'll start today with a brief PowerPoint presentation on the examination of the treatment of Joseph Dodd's view from my room followed by a virtual studio tour where I'll be describing some basic tools of our trade and in the examination and treatment process. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so this first slide is just basically an overview of uh, what a conservator does. And a lot of this includes work that the general public might not expect or doesn't include hands-on work at all. Um, in many circumstances, a conservator may provide condition assessment for a work of art, for sale, exhibition, or for traveling purposes. We may also have the opportunity to travel with art as a courier for insurance purposes or work with large and small institutions in conducting 
site visits or performing collection surveys. Surveys might be for the purpose of obtaining grants to do uh, whatever future work they might have or to identify factors in their storage and exhibition that might be negatively affecting the condition of the works in their collection. Okay, so um, not every museum or institution has a conservator on staff, and that's where conservators and private practice come in. So this, this work had some condition issues that were distracting enough to require a specialist to treat it before exhibition. So I'm gonna have a closer look at each of the condition issues that were present um, at the painting and the following details. And this is an overview so it's an overall image of the painting as it arrived in the studio. Generally speaking, it was in very good condition. And I'll present some additional details, but I don't know if you can make out. There's a, I'm wondering if I have like a pointer. I can annotate. Anyway, there's a scratch in the lower left quadrant and I'll be showing a detail of that. But as we examine the painting, other things became um, more apparent. So uh, the surface was also generally grimy due to its age and being in storage for some time. Um, and then we begin any sort of examination or treatment with a thorough condition assessment. And we employ various techniques of examination to identify condition issues. Oops. Sorry, having some technical difficulties. There we go. Um, the image on the left shows what we call use of a raking light. So that's a light positioned at a sharp angle at the surface to reveal any lumps or depressions in the canvas. And there is a slight de depression, like a series of uh, lumps in the upper left highlighted by the light. They show up as kind of shadows and we, um, we try to capture that in our image before treatment. And there is a detail of the scratch in the, in, in the image on the right. So beside any stability issues, cracks or losses associated with the canvas and paint layers, we also examine the painting for its surface coatings, for any uh, discolorations or for um, irregular, irregularities in gloss and sheen. So this one is coated with a natural resin containing varnish and natural resins emit a green yellowish fluorescence when excited in ultraviolet radiation. And I have UV bulbs in my photography set up to help document this when it makes sense so I can turn them on and off in between captures. Um, in this case, the varnish had some gaps that appeared matte compared to the surrounding um, varnished layer. They were distracting enough to address during treatment, but the entire varnish was not discolored in any way, any noticeable way that might detract from the appearance of the painting. So it was not um, removed. So the image on the left is what we call uh, specular illumination where um, we shine a light on the surface to capture any irregularities in gloss. And you can see that there's a matte square on the very right edge of the painting and the same area is captured head on where it appears kind of lighter than the surrounding areas. So that image is in the middle. And on the right is an image taken under ultraviolet radiation showing the gaps uh, of, the, of the varnish layer. So then we move on to uh, testing the surface for safe and effective ways to remove the dirt layers. So these are two test swabs along the edge showing a moderate layer of dirt pickup. Um, and an additional scratch on the surface was also identified along the left side here in the same area of the dent. So it's probably caused by the same damage. So there's a scratch and there's a dent in the same area. And before we begin any sort of aesthetic treatments, 
Um, we address any sort of structural problems with the canvas. And luckily this one didn't have any major structural issues. It had the little dent and small dents like this can be humidified locally and addressed. So it was placed face down on a soft blotter layer and then lightly humidified in the area of the bump and then allowed to um, dry under um, sort of mild weights. And this process may repeat, be repeated several times if the painting, if it's necessary, if it doesn't completely reduce. So then we can address the surface cleaning, um, any, any issues with the surface. And uh, the image on the left, again, is a test swab showing the moderate layer of dirt removed. And the image on the right, and I'll highlight kind of a clean square along the right edge there. It's not very noticeable in a detail like this, but sometimes um, the effect of a cleaning kind of pops out once the whole painting is complete and it um, generally appears brighter. So once a uh, Cleaning is finished, then we move on to addressing any um, other irregularities or condition issues on the surface. And this one, beside the two scratches, had a series of abrasions and losses along the very top edge. And these are caused with, um, by rubbing and abrasion by uh, old frame rabbits. And because uh, this painting was going right on exhibition with a new frame, we weren't sure how much of that top edge would remain visible. So the fills were, um, the losses were filled with a material that brings the loss back up to the layer of the surrounding paint. Um, otherwise, the losses would still be visible even after in painting. And oftentimes, um, fill material is textured to imitate the surrounding area so that once in painting is done, it's, it's almost completely imperceptible. And the losses, so the image on the right um, is the local cleaning of the losses to make sure that the level is completely, the losses are completely level with the surface layer and nothing around it is concealed by, by the loss material or by the fill material in any way. So here are the two scratches. They did, they were a bit deep and had resulted in some paint loss, pretty minor paint loss, but they were filled to kind of match the surrounding uh, paint layer. So once the fills and all the other surface irregularities are addressed, we move on to in painting. And here's just some details. So the image on the left, I am in the process of in painting the losses along the top edge. And the images on the right show a before and after, after of the scratch in the bottom center of the painting. So before is on top and after you see on the bottom. And here is an overall um, painting before treatment. You can see the scratch. Um, you, can, you can also make out the losses and abrasion along the top edge. And here is an image of the painting after treatment. So every major stage of the treatment um, process is completely documented with high resolution, high resolution digital photography, which is included um, in the treatment records, which should be uh, saved by every institution. Um, and now I'll kind of walk you through with the typical process, showing you our setup here, and just a sample of the materials and tools we might use um, in our practice. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll do a virtual studio tour. Let's see. Okay. So my idea um, today was to sort of walk you through what path the painting would take as it enters the studio, um, just to give you a bit of background. I share a 1,200 square foot studio. It's con it's a it's hard to get. A whole view here. This is our first virtual tour, so I apologize for any um, bumpiness on the way, but um, it's a pretty large space. It's pretty busy in here right now. We have a lot of paintings out. Um, we're pretty happy with the lighting and our windows 
and the building in general, we share with um, other artistically minded people. We share it with uh, furniture makers and ceramicists. In fact, we had one of the companies, Urban Tree, build us this custom made uh, painting storage unit. So we, we store works of art and bulk materials in there, which is really helpful for busy times like this. Um, this is our photography area. I kind of have a sample painting there with um, our setup and lights. There's a neutral gray background. And I'll swing the camera back around again. So once we've documented the condition of the painting through uh, photo documentation, we examine it from the support layers up. So when I say support, I mean whatever the painting is painted on and it could be various supports or could have various supports. This one is a work on canvas, very typical. Um, it's stretched on a four member wooden stretcher it has some pretty serious structural issues. So we note those first as it comes in. Um, the canvas is actually ripped in multiple locations. Um, I'll try to bring it closer. There's some glare coming through the window, but you can make out there's some pretty complex tears. Um, I also have a painting here that's on board. So oil paintings on board have their own kind of condition issues associated with warping of the support layer. This one had some previous water damage that affected the bottom and you can see that the entire lower edge is missing and there's some paint lifting and flaking along the lost edge. I also have another small painting here that's actually painted on paperboard. And so we, we have to deal with any condition issues that might be spurred on by damage to the paperboard um, as opposed to wood or canvas. So after we've looked at the support, we look at the condition of the paint layer, um, the paint and ground. And there are some minor losses along the, the areas of the tear. Um, and we'll also do some surface testing to see if there are um, heavy dirt layers on the surface, nicotine, tar, soot. Um, if there's a discolored varnish, what kind of varnish is it? So we'll make note of all of these things, put it in a report, well documented, um, do some testing along the very edge and the periphery of the painting before we can even start um, treating the painting. So there's, there's a lot of hands-off work that needs to happen before we, can, before we can get going and we need the approval of the client or institution and so on. So everything is very um, clear before we move forward. And I have some tools. So the station that I have set up right here is mainly focused on stabilizing uh, paint layers and uh, issues with the support. So a lot of times we need to locally humidify something. We, we have various sheets of metal that are exceptionally thin that we can slide between the canvas and stretcher to give it a hard support so that we can flatten areas that are deformed in any way. I have a few consolidants that we might use. So a consolidant is an adhesive that is applied to an area of a damage that stabilizes it. So we use a lot of natural consolidants. This one is actually sturgeon glue, which is made out of bladders of a sturgeon fish. And I process this myself. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty time consuming and smelly process. Um, I also have a lot of undissolved rabbit skin glue that we might also use. We also use gelatin. Um, all these things are reversible and we like them because they can be re-softened and the painting can be reworked 
if you have to restabilize any areas. Um, I also have various hand tools, these tiny tweezers. Um, we use uh, surgeon grade scalpels. And we roll our own swabs. So we um, source cotton by the roll and we go through so much cotton that we do not use Q-tips. We have to roll our own swabs. Um, so we have jars or containers of cotton in which we pull from and then we can make um, cotton swabs custom size to whatever service you're working on. I also have, this might get a bit technical, but I have, um, it's a heat tool. And so we use this sometimes when we're consolidating and something needs to be locally relaxed. This emits um, very direct heat to a very specific area. So if we need to melt any adhesives, uh, soften paint layers, this tool is really useful. It's actually manufactured uh, especially for me by the uh, company to emit a lower, uh, temp a lower temperature grade. So it starts at zero and it goes up from there rather than the uh, other commercial soldering units which start at really high temperatures and are pretty unsafe for paint surfaces. Um, this whole table that I'm working on is a nine foot hot suction table. We have, we're equipped with two hot suction tables in this studio. You can remove linings or line paintings if necessary. They're both pretty interventive treatments, um, but we have this giant table in case we need to, in case we need to do that. Um, I'm going to move over to another area of the studio where I have some materials laid out specifically for loss compensation, filling and in painting. So this is gonna be awkward because I'm gonna move this whole, uh, this whole camera unit. I have a lovely assistant here, Rika Falk, who is a fellow paintings conservator. We share the studio. So I have no idea how I'm doing on time. So I'm just gonna keep talking, but um, I have plenty some... of time. You're doing great. You've got okay, plenty of time. Good, good. I feel like I'm kind of just talking to myself. It's very strange. Um, so I have a lot of materials set out here specifically used for filling and in painting. Um, so filling, I described briefly that process in the uh, treatment of the Dodd. So uh, we use various fill materials. A lot of them are just calcium carbonate based mixed with uh, an animal glue like rabbit skin. Um, we also use toned wax resin. Say so you have various losses and the surface of the paint has a lot of impasto and you wanna recreate those uh, brush strokes and, and peaks and whatnot. You can, these are actually, um, specially made conservation grade wax resin sticks that can be melted and molded into very small losses and then textured with either heat tools or heated tools. Um, I also have a lot of in painting materials. So everything that we do has to remain reversible over time. Um, so we choose are in painting materials dependent on what the painting is made from. And this gets challenging when you're dealing with modern contemporary surfaces or surfaces that have a lot of um, sensitivity issues. You need to still choose materials that can be removed separate from the paint. So the paint will never be affected by its removal in the future should it have to be treated again. Um, I've just chosen a selection of materials. So we use a lot of water-based materials, watercolor, gouache. These are all things that are resoluble with water. Um, I also have some pastel pigments, which can be shaved down and applied with a small brush if 
you need something uh, dry and matte. And then I also have various colors dispersed in synthetic resins. And we do use a lot of synthetic resins in in-painting because it remains completely reversible, separate from the oil paint or whatever paint you're, you're trying to imitate. But um, you can imitate a lot. You can, um, we just use it a lot. So uh, we have a couple of synthetic resins that have very varying solubility properties or even sometimes varying gloss levels. So sometimes if one thing doesn't work out, then you often choose another thing. Um, we also use a lot of just dry pigments. So behind me is our pigment collection in this cabinet. I don't know if you can see that. I'll get close. Yeah, we can all see that. Um, and I'm okay. sorry that it's like you're talking to the void. It's, it's one of the oh, yeah, very... Yeah. I'm very empathetic after a year of virtual tours, but it's fascinating. And we're actually getting some questions coming in. So people are definitely engaged. Good. I think it'll help if I open the doors to get a little bit less glare. But um, yeah, this is a pigment collection. And in painting is just one of those things that you get better with at time. And it does help to know kind of what pigments were available at the time period you're you're trying to imitate, so that while you're not you're not using the same medium, but you are you can use the same pigment, which helps a lot. Um, sometimes it's it's just experience that kind of guides your hand. A lot of people have questions about in painting, but it's it's just kind of one of those things where it's practice makes perfect, and a lot of knowledge of uh, pigments and properties of in painting materials. Um, we also have a lot of bulking agents down there, things that add texture like uh, marble dust and um, micro glass micro balloons, which are tiny little beads that can be used as like thickening or texturizing agents. Um, I have a couple examples of materials we use for varnishing. So we have a compressor. It's actually located over there, but we don't have a spray booth currently. We are lucky enough to be able to use Urban Tree spray booth. So they have a whole room that's dedicated to spraying and has special exhaust so that we can safely be in there using solvents and varnishing if we need to. So we're very grateful for the use of theirs. Um, but we do our varnishing if the painting needs varnish. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, we use a lot of synthetic. So sometimes we'll use a different synthetic versus what we use for in painting so that they can, so that if you do varnish, you're not disturbing your in painting, which can be a horrible experience. Um, or we also have uh, natural resin. So this is a jar of Damar. Um, it's a tree resin that's obtained and, and we can solubilize this in, in solvents. Um, it makes a good varnish, but Damar does yellow over time. So we can, we add a special chemical to help slow its oxida oxidation and help stabilize it to, to light. Um, those are just the materials I have out. I can kind of swing the camera around a little bit more and we have a microscope for more tedious jobs like tear repair. Um, Rika has fashioned these really excellent um, storage racks for frames because we unframe things and then frames are literally everywhere. So it's good to have somewhere away supported that the frames can be without them taking up too much space. It, it gets really um, unmanageable in here when you have a lot of things on the table. You have to be very careful. Um, continue to swing around. All of our uh, chemical storage is back there in these safe chemical safe cabinets. And our glassware is here. So we have a lot of jars for mixing concoctions, uh, solvents, varnishes, gels. Um, 
anything wet or solvent related goes on back there. So we keep it very separate from all of the work that goes on up here. Um, there's Rika working. She's working at her easel. Hi, Rika. Um, and we have an object in here. So um, we occasionally share our studio with Rhonda Wozniak and she is a local objects conservator. And actually we collaborate on quite a few projects. So um, she's often pulled in, like most recently we worked together on a Russian icon where um, there's a painted center and there's an elaborate silver um, frame around it. So she cleaned the frame and I did the painted parts. And occasionally she's in here working on objects that are too large for her studio. So we're, we're also happy to have her and we're happy to have those collaborations. Um, I think I've pretty much covered everything that I had prepared for. I'm not sure how much time is left for Q&A. Hi, so I've popped back on screen. As you see, unfortunately, I've had to move away from the Joseph Dodd because our galleries are opening to the public and we want um, people to be able to view and enjoy those. So I'm, uh, I've moved to a different space, but we've actually had quite a collection of questions already come in. Um, so we'll start to go through those. But before we do, I just had a question to launch us because as a university art museum, I think we're always concerned with training and background. And I don't know if you know, but we recently started a technical art history program here. Um, so I was just a little bit curious and as to your background, if you could share, especially if there are students who might be interested in conservation and in, in the audience um, or the more technical aspects of art history, a little bit about um, your training and you know perhaps apprenticeships or fellowships, how you kind of ended up where you are. Yeah, sure. Um, I personally, um, obtained my bachelor's in art history, but there are graduate programs in art conservation. There are a few of them in the States, uh, namely Buffalo State College, uh, University of Delaware, NYU, and there's an archeological program at the Getty. You can apply to those programs if you meet their prerequisites. So while you might obtain your bachelors in any number of things. There's a lot of chemistry majors that go on to become art conservators and artists. They, they want to see those specific prerequisites. So while I um, got a degree in art history, I still needed to do a lot of studio art and chemistry um, to meet those prerequisites. So it is a bit challenging and um, there, I don't know what their current um, requirements are for pre-program experience, but they also want to see that you've had some hands-on experience in conservation uh, before even applying. You have to present a portfolio and you have to show that you have good hand skills. Um, UD has a drawing test. Uh, they make sure you're not colorblind. I mean, it's, it's pretty intense. Um, if you if you're a student and you have specific questions about admissions, feel free to email me. Um, maybe my email can be shared in the chat. Great, yeah, no, we will do that. And like I said, I just, I, I open with that question just because it's something that's always on our mind as a, as a, a university kind of institution. Um, but I'm gonna go to, um, several people have, have dropped questions in the Q&A and um, we'll, I'll, throw you some of those if you have uh if anyone out in the audience has any questions feel free now is the time to put them there um so uh elizabeth would like to know what is the oldest piece of art you have worked on um that's a challenging question <laughs> i mean uh it's hard to say because you've you i've done like a fair amount of work in modern contemporary. So that's my primary background. But in school and elsewhere and in private practice, you can treat a whole range of materials. Um, maybe Spanish colonial is perhaps the oldest I've personally treated. Um, okay. 
Yeah, you get the odd painting here and there. <laughs> I mean, tons from the 19th century, really. Because this area is ripe with portraits. So portraits and landscapes. Uh, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, well, and actually, I think kind of moving along from this, uh, uh, Dr. Rhonda Raymond, who's one of our art history professors, was wondering, what are some of the issues that you have to address that are maybe particular to modern and contemporary paintings? Or, or um, since that's your specialty, you know, maybe what drew you there? What are the particular issues of modern and contemporary paintings? Yeah, um, modern and contemporary painting is really challenging. You're dealing with surfaces that are potentially very vulnerable to abrasion and even the smallest rubs, damage, just stand out so much more because there's less, less area to hide in. So take mm -hmm. a color field painting, um, mostly the same color. If something small happens, it's, it's pretty much off view because you can't, it's unexhibitable. So um, like I treated a metallic painting and it was overpainted with um, metallic acrylic. So I was removing metallic paint from metallic paint, which is really challenging. But when you disturb metallic paints, you also disturb the mica powder that's in them. Mm. So the whole shine shifts. And to recreate that shine on a local surface is really challenging. You have to try a lot of different resins, a lot of different uh, materials to kind of imitate the original and Sometimes you can get it face on perfect, but as soon as you start moving around it or going to the side, it looks different. So you have to work under varying lighting conditions. You have to look at it under normal illumination, tungsten lighting, you know, what, what kind of lighting is gonna be present when it's on exhibition. Um, you just have to consider a lot of, a lot of different things. Also, yeah, and oh, sorry, I was going to just follow up. Uh, Dr. Raymond's second part of her question was actually asking a little bit about new technologies and techniques that might be promising to kind of grapple with some of these challenges for modern and contemporary um, painting. So um, cleaning is always really problematic with acrylic paintings in, in, um, in general because acrylic paint swells when it's exposed to water and typically that's what you surface clean a painting with you use water so there are so the latest um sort of studies in conservation are have been geared very strongly to cleaning acrylics and cleaning modern paintings and how we expose the surface to water or mm -hmm. other solvents and get the same cleaning action without swelling. So that could involve changing the conductivity of the solution and how that affects the surface. Um, it could get really technical here. I was afraid that um, the closed captioning or the these <laughs> people, but. Um, well, you see why you need a chemistry background as well and not just the, um, or more of a technical background in addition to the art historical and painting. Right, right, right. For sure. Um, Rosemary, who's one of the museum's docents, is wondering if, what you were able to tell about uh, Dodd's technique or how he created that painting by conserving his work. So kind of what do you discover as you, as you go through this process? Um, really fine painter. I mean, just, just really well done. You just get um, a really good sense of the quality of the work when you see his technique kind of up close. And um, you can tell it's very direct. He knew exactly what he wanted to achieve. There are no changes in the composition that are visible sometimes they can become more visible over time. So um, yeah, he knew what he wanted and he accomplished it with as little pain as possible. Like there's really, there's really light impasto. So everything is really well blended. Um, one interesting thing, I didn't put a picture on, but there's a handprint. Um, so he handled the painting when the varnish was still wet 
and it left his fingerprint smudged in the upper right hand corner. And it's that kind of thing where, where you're like, that's not damaged. That's, that happened in his studio. Like that's something we, we might want to save because that, that just shows the presence of the artist. Um, um, so it's just, it's just kind of fun to see those little touches that other people might not notice. And you're like, oh, that's, that's kind of, it puts you right there when you see that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I, I imagine that those are some of the decisions you have you have to make in, in in your work about what is damage and what isn't. So, um, Megan Light, who is another professor in the art history department, you can see there's a there's a theme here <laughs> in terms of thinking about our students and our our um, position because she asked, "Do you ever take on interns as part of your practice in Pittsburgh?" Um, we haven't considered it mostly uh, because of the fact that the past few years, my primary, uh, I traveled a lot. So it was, it was very challenging to take on somebody and kind of guide them, feel like I could guide them through the whole process when I was traveling for work. And uh, most of my work the past two years were in other states. So uh, that part was challenging. And this part is also challenging dealing with de dealing with COVID, but perhaps we'll come out of that in the next year and um, we'll make it through our backlog and, and be in a good place. But yeah, interns- well, we'll, de we'll definitely be in touch because as, as we develop this, this program, if, if that's something you're open to, certainly. Um, some more questions coming in. Uh, Todd Tabutis, the museum's director, asks of a diff, um, if you could define for the audience the difference between conservation and restoration of works of art. Sure. Um, they're both kind of all encompassing. They can be kind of all encompassing terms, but uh, conservation as a term in practice is really. Uh, meant to describe the act of conserving what's present, like saving what's there and not recreating anything. Restoration, on the other hand, is the process of uh, restoring the appearance of something. So, but restoring as a practice can also mean altering the original. So if you say you're restoring a car, you might repaint it like we don't repaint things here um everything is done minimally and ethically to preserve um and showcase what is what is there so our first and foremost goal is to save what's there and not necessarily recreate it and that's why you choose uh, you know all adhesives and and pigments that are removable as well, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can, so that they're not necessarily a permanent feature. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Cindy O'Brien, who is also a docent at, at the museum would like to know um, about uh, mixed media work. And if you have ever um, worked with, you know, mixed media paintings or if they present any particular challenges, um, something that's not just a painting, but maybe has other materials or things in it. Yeah, I mean, as a, especially a person who's had experience with contemporary works in, um, I worked also in a private practice in New York City and we saw an incredible amount of mixed media works. Um, very common in modern contemporary, um, but it's, it's where it's, it makes us very glad to have such close colleagues um, we have in other disciplines. So that's why I, I'm so thrilled to have Rhonda share our studio with us and to bring her in on specific projects that involve metals or other substrates or things that have stability issues that I'm not entirely comfortable with. Um, paper, uh, there's a lot of paintings on paper and oftentimes I'll bring in or refer um, a specialist in paper. And we have a couple here in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh specifically. So that I'm very happy to say that. Um, 
yeah, always presents challenges. Every painting is different. You never know what kind of materials you're going to get or, or what you're going to be dealing with. Um, I treated an Anselm Kiefer a couple of years ago that had lead parts. And I mean, it was mostly structural and he builds up his surfaces with this um, really thick paste. And in areas it's, you know, maybe an inch and a half to two oh, inches. Wow. And he takes a, a torch to it to make it crack even more. Um, people incorporate ceramic pieces onto surfaces. Um, there were twigs on it, with the leaves falling off. Um, yeah, it's just, so we rely heavily on our colleagues and we rely heavily on specialists who deal with really weird and unusual materials. And luckily the field is small enough that we, if we don't already know them, we can ask around and um, find them. Yeah, and on the, on the subject of challenges, I don't know if mixed media is it, but someone wanted to actually just know most uh, broadly, what is the most challenging aspect of art conservation? And you, you've already hinted at a lot of challenges, but I didn't know if you had one that you wanted to hone in on. Oh man. Um, <laughs> like with the, with conservation, especially in private practice, I feel like there's challenges that, in a lot from a lot of different angles because you're dealing with people and you're dealing with high quality and very expensive paintings and you're dealing with their owners and so all of that all of that has challenges but it's hard to say any one i would say um i would say in painting modern services and dealing with their stability issues is probably the most challenging um, for me. If you ask another conservator, they might might say different. It's just that there's so the number of variables that come into play when you're trying trying to imitate a service and the um, all the number of tests you can conduct make it a lot more complicated than it sounds and time consuming. <laughs> and going back to sort of the earlier in your presentation, I don't know if you're getting feedback on another challenge from your Rick from is, your studio. Rick is trying to tell me a challenge. Um, <laughs> you can. We're we're more than happy to hear other challenges. Yeah, Rick says um, it's letting go of the paintings when they're out of your hands because <laughs> you have no control as to what happens to them and where they're exhi you know exhibited in the end. Um, so it's like you're sending your baby out the door. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. And I can imagine if there are, you know, private collectors and things like that, that aren't in kind of controlled museum environments that, you know, things might go back, right back to environments with tobacco or soot or things like that. After you, yeah, you so to, you have to be realistic and you have to have realistic expectations and you have to be able to describe those realistic expectations to the client so that everybody is on the same page. It's really important. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting thing to look at both the technical part of, you know, the in painting and all of that, but then the larger context of what you're doing, especially in private practice and working with, with clients. And I think uh, it's interesting to hear from both sides of that. Um, Gabe would like to rewind to Sturgeon Blue <laughs> and talk about uh, why, uh, and I think maybe you alluded to this, but why you, chose to make stur sturgeon adhesive and uh, um, and what benefits you saw from that and what, what made you consider or create it? So I didn't create it. So sturgeon glue um, has been used in conservation practice for decades. I mean, just forever. It's this is a very traditional material. We use a lot of traditional materials but sturgeon glue made from sturgeon bladders and not just any fish bladder um, actually is a really nice workable adhesive. It's very pure. So um, you purify it when you produce it. And um, the way 
it has working properties that make it very appealing. So it actually flows really nicely. So your painting is, is cracked like this. You can flow it in between the cracks and it flows really nicely and has a very, very good tack, but not too strong. So we like things that have working properties kind of in the middle, like not too weak, not too strong. It kind of falls in the middle. It's very, it remains somewhat flexible and reworkable over time. So you can re-moisten an area and reactivate it. Um, it's just a really nice adhesive to use. It's just a shame that it comes from, from sturgeon fish. <laughs> but, yeah, a bladder goes a long way. Well, that's good. At least, <laughs> at yeah. least you can get get a lot out of a, a sturgeon bladder. Um, someone would like to know if you if you've dealt with mildew or organic damage, and how you um, how you deal with something like that. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty challenging. Um, there were a lot of conservators called to be emergency on site uh, responders when New York City was flooded. Um, so a lot of galleries had storage spaces in their basement and it became a catastrophic event for a lot of galleries and even institutions that had materials stored below um, street level. And um, people went there in hordes to help out. And um, yeah, the mold is, was really terrible. Um, it's hard because you're dealing with paintings that are sensitive. So you can minimize the mold and mold spores, but the threat is kind of always there if it's ever re-exposed to um, areas of high humidity. Spores are microscopic. So we first would, um, would vacuum it using a HEPA filter and try to clean any embedded dirt or um, mold using dry erasers, um, different soot sponges, dry, dry means of removing the material. Um, and then you hope to kill any remaining spores by a very dilute solution, including alcohol. Um, you just want to be careful with alcohol because you could also cause damage to the pain. So it's a very um, tedious process and, and we have to use minimal amounts of water and alcohol. So we have dealt with it in the past. Um, it is challenging, but it's not impossible. Sometimes things are written off for, for insurance reasons because they're covered with mold. Um, but yeah, I, it's, um, it is challenging. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we have a few minutes left and there are already some more questions in the chat. So we'll try and get to as many as we can before one. I appreciate you um, being so generous with uh, your time and your knowledge. Um, so TB would like to know if there are any um, art conservation grants or funding, you know, if uh, I'm not sure where that, where, where that question is coming from, whether a personal want or need or uh, um, institutional, but if you know of any institutions that kind of support the conservation uh, work that you do? There are grants at the local and federal level. I can't, um, I can't name, I can't name them specifically. So while conservators have applied to grants, it's usually the institution that is responsible for the actual grant process. And we provide supplemental information and reports and recommendations. Um, so we could be pulled in on the grant writing process, but personally, I haven't written a grant. A lot of conservators have. Um, Rika, do you know any grants in particular? <laughs> Which one? There's grants uh, from the Getty. Mm -hmm. FAIC. So it sounds like there are some resources out there, but that, that maybe this question asks her if, there, if it's a personal resources. question. I'm totally blanking. Um, NEH, yeah, there's a lot of NEH grants. Um, mm -hmm. There were some recent ones. I, I would have to 
to think about that and kind of answer specifically. Yeah, that's fine. And if anything comes to your mind, you can you can send me an email because um, I've got all the, the registrants email addresses. Um, so a few more. Uh, do any of the uh, conservation grad programs include instruction in business or accounting? Um, it would seem that in addition to chemistry, art, history, and art, that conservators in private practice also have to manage the small business side of their yeah. of their work. No, we don't. <laughs> so <laughs> the graduate programs are three years. So two years is hands-on uh, treatment practice and learning about historical materials and condition issues. The third year is spent on site in a museum and um, they try to incorporate a seminar on private practice. Um, but really it was like a one to two day overview of where to look for um, if you have specific questions. So when I moved to Pittsburgh, I actually took some courses from the Small Business Administration and um, talk to other conservators in private practice. And really, if it weren't for having worked at a uh, private conservation studio, I, I would have a lot less know-how in the business portion, but I had that experience and was lucky to have that experience. And I think without it, it, it is really challenging um, to deal with insurance and contracts and and invoicing and budgeting. I mean, it's it can be overwhelming, but um, there are resources if you seek to find them yourself, but there's nothing in the program that kind of guides you. So it sounds like that that would maybe be valuable for at least some component of people going into their own practice. Um, do you feel like conservators also engage in research as part of their practice in terms of what materials artists use, what is known about their processes? So do you consider yourself a researcher at all? Yeah, um, unfortunately, private practice takes away a lot of the time that you would have had doing research like that because that kind of research is usually um, for, you know, for publication, you might not necessarily get time uh, paid for for that for those kinds of things. And um, luckily, there are conservators that work at institutions that time is built into their schedule specifically for research purposes. And when you're a conservator in training, you um, you're on various internships and fellowships that where they are primarily research fellowships. So I spent a year at the National Gallery of Art studying Dieben, Richard Diebenkorn's materials and techniques and how they relate to condition issues and presented on it a number of times. Um, but you, you're still presented with research opportunities. I just think that in private practice, it's a bit more challenging to work that into your schedule, um, especially if it involves um, traveling, uh, a lot of my research in the past involved going to paint to see paintings in person to obtain samples if they let you and to run analysis and we simply don't have the resources to run our own analysis without um, contracting another person to do that for us so it just you know it's a it's a shame that we that we that we don't have the ability to right now but we a lot of our training is in that sort of research or oriented mindset okay yeah no and it sounds like i mean you have to have your head at least in that process to even know what materials to use and what um, how to interact with the painting so even if you don't have the time to publish and present <laughs> Yeah, uh, I would say that we do, I mean, with every painting, we do do our own mini research. So we, if we're not familiar with the materials involved, there is some degree of the research that we have to take on ourselves, And right. it's just part of growing as a professional to, to be able to have that knowledge. So we're constantly learning and teaching ourselves and uh, participating in sort of educational opportunities that will you know broaden our horizons 
Great. Um, so I'm going to give you a one final question because we've hit the one o'clock mark and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. But Elizabeth wants to know if um, you've ever worked with painting on glass or porcelain. So you've talked about the kind of traditional painting surfaces, but if there's any um, anything that if you if you've ever worked with painting on like a hard surface or things like that. Yeah, so glass is really challenging, as you might imagine, because it's a non porous substrate so non porous support transparent and um, mostly you're viewing the paint from behind the glass so if it's peeling off you have to introduce adhesive between the paint and the glass that won't affect um, how you view the painting so you won't you can't you shouldn't be able to see the adhesive, which makes it challenging. So there are specific adhesives that we use to re-adhere painting back onto glass, but because glass is so smooth, it's, um, it's really hard. Sometimes you have to work upside down. So people have constructed special tables to hold the glass. And um, oftentimes the paint is resting like this on the surface. So it needs to remain flat on a table, but you have to work with it so that you can see through it. So they've, they've devised these clear tables so you can still look underneath, see your work, add more adhesive and, and proceed in that, in that way. It's very challenging um, <laughs> to say the least. Oh. <laughs> It sounds like it. So it sounds like overall we're hearing that there's a lot of challenges, but yeah. that they sound like really fun challenges to to try to figure out how to make it work to do the best you can to conserve these works of art. So we are so grateful to you for sharing your expertise and your time today. I think just by the level of it, there are even a few questions that trickled in that we didn't get to. I think just by the level of engagement of questions, I can say, um, speak for our audience and say, I think everyone was really fascinated and it was really illuminating for people to see and hear um, how you do how you do this. And we're very grateful to have our wonderful Dodd painting on display. Um, so as I said, I can tell everyone, this is our last public program of the academic year. The uh, McGee Gallery will be open for the next uh, two weeks if you wish to come down and see the Dodd. And I can also announce that that exhibition is going to remain on display throughout the fall semester of 2021. Uh, we will be closed for the summer, but if you don't get a chance to make it down here in the next two weeks, you can come uh, in August and see it, uh, see it in the fall. And we will also have uh, a new exhibition opening in August as well. So we're entering into a little bit of our quiet season, but we want to thank all of our um, friends and supporters for supporting us through this year. And we are really looking forward to seeing you in person again for these programs. And thank you very much to Anna for being our guest today. We appreciate your time and expertise. Everyone have a wonderful end to your spring semester and we hope to see you soon. Take thank care. Thank you for having me. Thank you.